Welcome and peace be with you. Our program tonight is the third part of the whole of the Four Holy Women of God series. And tonight we're gonna explore the life of Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. So let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Every true prayer is a prayer of the church. By means of that prayer, the church prays, since it is the Holy Spirit living in the church who in every single soul prays in us with unspeakable groanings. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So St. Teresa of the Cross, and her birth name was Edith Stein. This is a photo of Wroclaw, which was formerly known as Breslau. It was formerly in Germany, and now it's in Poland. So here's a little historical background. The city of Breslau is now located in in Poland, and you might be able to see that on the map to the right-hand side. Jewish people began to settle in this district as early as the 1200s. And by the 16th century, Jewish merchants began to become much more numerous and vital to the economy. So by 1790, the ruling Prussian government began to provide citizenship documents for some Jews, those they felt who were essential to the economy. Unfortunately, during the World War II, all but 200 Jews out of a total of over 20,000 in Breslau were deported and killed in extermination camps. Edith Stein's early life. She was born on October 12, 1891. She was born on the day of Yom Kippur, that is the day of atonement, the most holy day in the Jewish calendar. And this made her quite precious to her mother. She was the youngest of 11 children, but four of her siblings died in infancy, which is not uncommon for those times. She was always seen as the smart one, and she was often seen lurking in the shadows of photographs, but with a book in her hand. This is the earliest known photo of her. Uh, it's, she's about three years old in this photo, and you can see she's sitting there, and there's a book in her hand. Now, this same photo has been doctored uh, so that her father, who died when she was only one, would appear to be with the family. So she's three years old. This is two years after her father died, but he's there. And then her mother, her her name was Auguste, and she uh, was left to struggle with a debt-ridden timber business that her husband had established and a house full of children. Edith's older sister, Elsa, uh, became her surrogate mother for much of her youth. Now, while her mother succeeded in maintaining their family business and home, she was less successful in nurturing the faith in her children. And by the time Edith became a teenager, she was convinced that she was an atheist. She maintained this attitude all during her secondary school education, that is through high school, and well into her college years. She was an exceptional student, and she graduated at the top of her class in Breslau and almost every other class after that. She's pictured here with her sister, Emma. Now, in her college years, in 1911, Edith completed her secondary school education and enrolled at the University of Breslau. And she enrolled in German language and history classes. But her real interest was in philosophy and in women's issues. Uh, So she became a member of the Prussian Society for Women's Franchise. And she's quoted from this time period. She says, when I was at school and during my first years at university, I was a radical suffragette. Then I lost interest in the whole issue. Now I am looking for purely pragmatic solutions. So she was thwarted in her uh, ambitions because she was a woman quite often. So the pragmatic solutions are how can she get an appointment? And she would would have to deal with that all her life. In 1913, Edith Stein transferred to the University of Göttingen uh, in Western Uh, Germany to study philosophy, and she became the student and the teaching assistant to Professor Edmund Husserl. He was attracting a lot of attention with new philosophical work and something he called phenomenology. So at Göttingen, she also met the philosopher Max Scheler, uh, who Edith would get to know quite well. And Scheler was, was recently converted to Catholicism, which was rather unique, and he shared many of his insights with Edith and the other students. And then another influential person she met was Adolf Reinbach, and he also worked with Husserl, and Reinbach was a Christian convert also. So Husserl's work 
unintentionally led many students and assistant professors toward Christianity. It wasn't his intention, but that's, that's the result. So traditionally, philosophy includes at least four core fields or disciplines. There's ontology, epistemology, ethics, and logic. So ontology is the study of beings or their being or what is. And then epistemology is the study of knowledge or how we know. And then logic is the study of valid reasoning or how to reason. And ethics is the study of what's right and wrong or how we should act. Now, phenomenology, which he had come up with, was a study of our experience or how do we experience things based on everything we've learned before. So while she was at college, all of a sudden the First World War broke out and that interrupted everybody's lives. And Edith had taken some nursing classes, so she was recruited to go to Austria. She's living in Germany, so she's on the other side of the First World War. She's with the Germans, uh, Austro-Hungarians, and the Ottoman Empire. So she went to Austria to serve in an army field hospital. Well, the war in the East went well for Austria, Hungary, and Germany, and Russia drops out of the conflict. So she's only there for a while. And, um, and she's quoted here as saying, I no longer have a life of my own. This was, a, was a, quite a distraction for her. She was serving in the typhus ward and in the operating rooms. And when the hospital was dissolved in 1916, Edith returned to being Husserl's teaching assistant at Gottingen. And she passed her doctorate, summa cum laude, with the utmost distinction in 1917 after writing a thesis on the problem of empathy. So she's now encountering other Catholic people, and this creates some first thoughts on conversion. So one day, she was going down the street, and she saw a woman on the street with a lot of shopping parcels, and she set them down on the steps of a Catholic church, and she went inside to pray. And now this surprised Edith that she would leave her her goods there. So she went in and watched her pray, and it had a profound effect on Edith. And then her friend Otto Freinbach, um, uh, he, he was killed in battle in Flanders, that's Belgium, on the Western Front in 1917. So Edith went to visit his widow and console her, and this she described as her first encounter with the power of the cross, uh, because the widow was not all in tears, all broken down. She had true faith, and she was very strong in the, in the loss of her husband, and she was also very welcoming and encouraging to Edith. Um, So Edith said that a visit to this widow was her first encounter with the power of the cross. It was the moment when my unbelief collapsed and Christ began to shine his light on me. Christ in the mystery of the cross. And by that she means the, the cross being the suffering, the suffering of life. And later she wrote, things were in God's plan which I had not planned at all. Isn't that true? I am coming to the living faith and conviction that from God's point of view, there is no chance and that the whole of my life down to every detail has been mapped out in God's divine providence and makes complete and perfect sense in God's all-seeing eyes. So after the war, Edith applied for a professorship, but she was denied because she was a woman. And then later she would do that again in 1930, but by that time, In Germany, she would be denied because she was a woman and also because she was a Jew. In April, or excuse me, in autumn of 1918, uh, Edith Stein uh, gave up her job as Husserl's teaching agent. And in the summer of 1921, she spent several weeks at the country estate of a a woman named Hedwig Conrad Martius. And she, this woman was another one of Husserl's pupils. Now, Hedwig had converted to Catholicism with her husband. And one evening, while Edith Stein was in the home of Hedwig, uh, Edith picked up the autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila, and she read the entire book in one, one single evening. And she says, when I had finished reading the book, I said to myself, this is the truth. And later, looking back on her life, she wrote, my longing for truth was a single prayer. Now, she continued her conversion, and she was baptized on January 1st, 1922, at the Feast of the Circumcision of Jesus, when Jesus entered into the covenant of Abraham. 
uh, which is very important for a person of a Jewish background. So she was confirmed by Bishop, uh, the Bishop of Spire, and Edith stood at the baptismal font wearing Hedwig Conrad Martius's white wedding cloak, and Hedwig was her godmother. I had given up practicing my Jewish religion when I was a 14-year-old girl and did not begin to feel Jewish again until I had returned to God. And from this moment on, she would continually aware that she belonged to Christ, not only spiritually, but also through blood. So the, the heritage of the Jewish people, the chosen race, she had that and Catholic faith. After her conversion, she went straight to, to uh, Breslau, to her mother's house, and she said, Mother, I am a Catholic. And the two women wept. And Hedwig Conrad Martius was there, and she wrote, Behold, two Israelites in whom there is no guile. And upon her conversion, Edith wanted to go and join a Carmelite convent, but the bishop and his spiritual mentors stopped her from doing so. Didn't say exactly why, but they didn't think she was uh, properly prepared just yet. So she took a position teaching German and history at the Dominican Sisters School and Teacher Training College at St. Magdalene Convent in Spire. And Archabbot Raphael Walzer uh, of Baron Abbey urged her to accept extensive speaking engagements, mainly on women's issues. So he had a he had a use for her. And uh, during the time immediately before and quite some time after my conversion, Edith writes, I thought that leading a religious life meant giving up all earthly things and having one's mind fixed on divine things only. Gradually, however, I learned that other things are expected of us in this world. I even believe that the deeper someone is drawn to God, the more he has to go beyond himself in this sense, that is, to go into the world and carry divine life into it. So she transferred, or she rather, she translated the letters and diaries of Cardinal Newman, uh, Cardinal Newman from Great Britain, and Thomas Aquinas, the medieval um, master, uh, and other Catholic saints into the German language for the sake of dialogue with modern philosophy. So she saw a link between philosophy and faith. In 1930, she saw Professor Husserl once again after her conversion, and she would have liked to, for him to have become Christian too. Uh, in contemplation of this event, she wrote down these amazing words. Every time I feel my powerlessness and inability to influence people directly, I become more keenly aware of the necessity of my own Holocaust. Very prophetic and very strange that she should write this in 1930. In 1931, Edith Stein left the convent school in Spire and devoted herself to working for a professorship again. But of course, her efforts were in vain, and I'd mentioned that earlier. This time she was denied that because she was both a woman um, and a Jew. In 1932, she accepted a teaching post in the Roman Catholic uh, Division of the German Institute for Educational Studies at the University of Munster. And in 1933, darkness broke out over Germany. And she says, I had heard of severe measures against Jews before, but now it dawned on me that God had laid his hand heavily on his people and that the destiny of these people would also be mine. Archabbot Walser now no longer stopped her from entering Carmel. And while inspired, she had already taken vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So she met the prioress of the Carmelite convent in Cologne. And she writes, human activity cannot help us, but only the suffering of Christ. It is my desire to share in it. And then she began writing some spiritual works. She wrote a document called Spirituality of the Christian Woman. And this was in 1932. There are two excerpts here that I'd like to share. She wrote, The deepest feminine yearning is to achieve a loving union which, in its development, validates this maturation and simultaneously stimulates and furthers the desire for perfection in others. Women's soul is present and lives more intensely in all parts of the body, and it was inwardly affected by that which happens to the body, whereas with men the body has more pronouncedly the character of an instrument with which serves them in their work and which is accompanied by a certain detachment. So if this sounds like she's a little bit anti-men, 
and it, it, her life experience had had pushed her in that direction. She was more sensitive. They seemed to be uh, less caring. She wrote another document called The Separate Vocations of Man and Woman According to Nature and Grace. So these thoughts were very much on her mind. And she writes, Christ embodies the ideal of human perfection. In him, all bias and defects are removed, and the masculine and feminine virtues are united, and their weaknesses redeemed. Therefore, his true followers will be progressively exalted over their natural limitations. That is why we see in holy men a tenderness and a truly maternal solicitude for the souls entrusted to them, while in holy women there is a manly boldness, proficiency, and determination. And she probably saw that in, um, in the religious leaders that she met, the bishop and others, but she also probably was thinking about the manly boldness, the strength being something that her mother had shown in uh, uh, taking over the family business, keeping them from going bankrupt and, and uh, continuing to provide for everybody. So she saw these two things happening. She wrote another document, which is on the history and spirit of Carmel. And she says, what is meant by the law of the Lord? Psalm 118, which we pray every Sunday and on solemnities at prime, is entirely filled with a command to know the law and to be led by it through life. The psalmist was certainly thinking of the law of the old covenant, knowing it actually did require lifelong study and fulfilling it, lifelong exertion of the will. But the Lord has freed us from the yoke of this law. We can consider the Savior's great commandment of love, which he says includes the whole law and the prophets as the law of the new covenant. Perfect love of God and of neighbor can certainly be a subject worthy of an entire lifetime of meditation. But we understand the law of the new covenant even better to be the Lord himself, since he has in fact lived as an example for us of the life we should live. We thus fulfill our rule when we hold the image of the Lord continually before our eyes in order to make ourselves like him. We can never finish studying the gospels. She sounds very much like St. Paul in, in how she presents this um, moving beyond the, the law of the old covenant. And then in 1933, after the Nazis, the National Socialist Party came to power and there was uh, outright and open persecution going on, she wrote a letter to uh, Pope Pius XI. And she says, as a child of the Jewish people, who by the grace of God for the past 11 years has also been a child of the Catholic Church, I dare to speak to the father of Christianity about that which oppresses millions of Germans. For weeks, we have seen deeds perpetrated in Germany which mock any sense of justice and humanity, not to mention love of neighbor. For years, the leaders of the National Socialism have been preaching hatred of the Jews, but the responsibility must fall, after all, on those who brought them to this point. And it also falls on those who keep silent in the face of such happenings. Everything that happened and continues to happen on a daily basis originates with a government that calls itself Christian. For weeks, not only Jews, but also thousands of faithful Catholics in Germany, and I believe all over the world, have been waiting and hoping for the Church of Christ to raise its voice to put a stop to this abuse of Christ's name. So she's very conscious of what's going on in the world. And now Edith Stein went to Breslau for the last time to say goodbye to her mother and her family. Her last day at home was her birthday, the 12th of October, 1933, which was also the last day of the Feast of the Tabernacles. And Edith went to the synagogue with her mother. It was a hard day for the two women. And, and her mother said, why did you become acquainted with it? Meaning Christianity. Her mother continued to ask, I don't want to say anything against him meaning Jesus, he may have been a very good person, but why did he make himself God? So this shows the gap in understanding between her mother uh, and Edith. But then after that visit, Edith entered the Carmelite convent of Cologne on the 14th of October, and she was clothed in the habit on 15th of April in 1934. And she was now known as St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. In 1935, she took her temporary vows, and on the 14th of September, 1936, the renewal of her vows coincided with her mother's death in Breslau. When she took her perpetual vows 
on 21st of April, 1938, she had the words of St. John of the Cross printed on her devotional picture. Henceforth, my only vocation is to love. And her final work of composition would be devoted to this author. And she was still writing. And in 1938, anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism of the Nazis became apparent to the whole world. The prioress of the Cologne uh, Carmel did her utmost to take St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross abroad. She was very uh, fearful of her safety. So on New Year's Eve in 1938, she was smuggled across the border into the Netherlands to a Carmelite convent in Ect, city of Ect. And um, uh, Teresa Benedicta says, I keep thinking of Queen Esther, Queen Esther from the Old Testament, who was taken away from her people precisely because God wanted her to plead with the king on behalf of her nation. I am a very poor and powerless little Esther, but the king has chosen me, is infinitely great and merciful. Okay, so what's happening in the outside world? The 9th and 10th of November, 1938, was known as Kristallnacht. And on that night, paramilitary and civilian gangs, um, Hitler Youth and gangs like it, smashed windows, burned shops and synagogues, and homes of Jewish citizens throughout Germany, every city, all on the same night. And 700 Jewish people were killed in the violence and countless more committed suicide in the days following when they saw that their business had been totally lost and their homes burned to the ground. The name Kristallnacht was associated with this, which means the night of broken glass because of all the shards of glass that lined the streets throughout Germany. The pretext for this persecution was that was a reaction to a German diplomat in Paris who had been shot by a Polish-born 17-year-old Jew. He was acting alone, don't know what his mental state was, but they, they were only looking for a pretext to, uh, to carry out this, this horrendous uh, evening of, of atrocity. And historians view this event as the first solution, which ultimately leads to the final solution, which was concentration camps and systematic genocide of the Jews throughout Germany and Europe. So in the city of Ect in the Netherlands, Teresa Benedicta hurriedly completed her study of the, of the church's teacher of mysticism and the farm, father of the Carmelites. She wrote a, wrote a biography on John of the Cross, and it was on the 400th anniversary of his birth. And John of the Cross was Teresa of Avila's supporter and confidant who uh, suffered imprisonment when he worked to create a reformed Carmelite or discalced shoeless uh, order for men comparable to Teresa's efforts. And you may recall that from part one of this series when we talked about the life of Teresa of Avila. In 1941, Teresa Benedicta went to a friend who was also a member of her order and said, one can only gain essentia crucius, that is knowledge of the cross, if one has thoroughly experienced the cross. The cross, I have been convinced of this from the first moment onwards and have said with all my heart, Ave Crux Spes Unica. I welcome you, cross, our only hope. And her study on St. John of the Cross is entitled, and I cannot pronounce that word, but it means the science of the cross. So outside in the world, there were uh, experimentations on humans, which came under the word eugenics. Germany under the Nazis began these experiments on humans uh, intent to create a master race and discover defects and how to correct them. Um, Experiments of this type fo focused on racial and ethnic characteristics and the elimination of what they thought were undesirable racial or behavioral health characteristics. And these were generally known as eugenics. Now, in the United States, at the same time, a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger uh, was the founder of the American Eugenics League. And she decided to go to Germany to observe these experiments uh, that were being carried out in secret laboratories and hospitals, and she wanted to learn from them. Now, Sanger was divorced, and one of her daughters, who was ill when she left, died of pneumonia from neglect because she left. She didn't leave them with the uh, good people to take care of them. So her daughter dies because of her trip to Germany. Now, after World War II, these crimes, these experiments on people were exposed. So Margaret Sanger decided to change the name of her organization from the American Eugenics Lead to Planned Parenthood. 
concentration camps and extermination camps were now built from 1933 uh, when the Nazis came into power until 1945 when they were finally defeated. They operated more than a thousand concentration camps on territory in Germany and in German occupied areas in Europe. Uh, the first camps were established in March 1933 after Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany. And initially, they were mostly for uh, members of the Communist Party of Germany. That was the most powerful party that opposed him in Germany at the time that he seized power. And then later prisoners included habitual criminals, social outcasts, and most especially Jews. Jews from Germany and Jews from other countries as well. After the beginning of World War II, the Jewish people in the German-occupied Europe were imprisoned in these camps and they were exterminated in greater numbers than the Jews uh, from Germany. The people operating these extermination camps killed over 10 million people. Six million were Jews, and over a million were children. There were, many of the rest were Catholics, including Father Maximilian Kolbe and others. Final journey. In 1942, the bishops of Netherlands, irate at the actions of the Nazis, issued letters to be read in each church condemning the Nazis for the systematic annihilation of the Jews. Now, the Nazis responded as one would expect. They began rounding up all the Jews who had converted to the Catholic faith and were living anywhere in the Netherlands, and they began transporting them to concentration camps all across Europe. Edith Stein was arrested by the Gestapo on the 2nd of August, 1942, while she was in chapel with her sisters in the, in the Carmel at Echt. And she was to report within five minutes, together with her sister Rosa, who had also converted and was staying at the Echt a Carmelite convert as an extern sister. And she writes, and when the night comes and you look back over the day and see how fragmentary everything has been and how much you planned that has gone undone, and all the reasons you have to be embarrassed and ashamed, just take everything exactly as it is, put it in God's hands, and leave it with him. So most of all the writing that we have on faith by Edith Stein was preserved in a handwritten form at the Carmelite Monastery in Act, and it only became known to the world and viewed by the world after the Allies liberated the Netherlands in 1945. Her final journey. Her last words to be heard in act were addressed to her sister Rosa. She said, come, we are going for our people. On the 7th of August, early in the morning, 987 Jews arrived by train at Auschwitz. They had been collected all across the Netherlands and loaded into cattle cars. All 987 persons were Jews who had become Catholics. More background, Auschwitz concentration and extermination camp. Auschwitz was founded in May 1940, and it continued until January 1945 when Russian troops liberated it. The inmates were mostly Jews, Poles, Romanians, and Soviet prisoners of war. The number of inmates over this time period is at least 1.3 million people, and 1.1 million were exterminated. The sign above the entrance said, Arbeit macht frei, work makes free, a parody on what was actually happening within the camp. It was probably on the 9th of August that Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross and her sister Rosa and many others of their people were killed in the poison gas chambers at Auschwitz. This is the view of the camp they would have seen as the train arrived and went through the the archway that goes into the center of the camp. And the picture at the, at the right is one of the gas chambers, a horrid looking place. St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross. She was born under the name of Edith Stein on October 12, 1891 in Breslau, Germany. And she died on August 9th, 1942 in the Auschwitz extermination camp. She was canonized in 1998 by Pope John Paul II and her feast day is on August 9th. She is a martyr and the co-patroness of Europe, and she's the author of The Science of the Cross. And the, work, and the word love is shown on this icon in, in the Star of David. It's written in Hebrew, and it says love, 
And then also on the icon are the numbers 44074. That was the number that she was given when she arrived at Auschwitz. So when we look at our Teresas, we have Teresa of Avila and Teresa of Lisieux on the left, and we have Teresa Benedicta on the right. And we know that for the two Teresas, their mother dies when they are young. But for Teresa Benedicta, it's her father who dies when she's young. And then their fathers are a strong influence in their life and faith. But Teresa Benedicta's mother leaves care to an older sister, and she is not very influential in the faith at all. They suffer ill health all their lifetime, and Teresa Benedicta suffers mental anguish from men all her lifetime. They were raised in devout Catholic families. She was raised in a very lax Jewish family. They become discal Carmelites. She becomes a discal Carmelite as well. Teresa leaves the cloister, Teresa of Avila, many times, frequently, but Therese does not. And Teresa Benedicta never leaves the cloister except to go to the Netherlands when she's reassigned. Teresa of Avila and Therese of Lisieux describe love within the church, and Teresa Benedicta describes love in the heart of humanity. Their writings are read by multitudes. Her writings are read by multitudes. And they are declared saints in the years 1622 and 1925, and she's declared a saint in the year 1998. St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, pray for us. Our next program will be on Teresa of Calcutta, or more commonly known as Mother Teresa. So let us close in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. Peace be with you.